Ever since I discovered 40k, I found the good old box melt absolutely awesome. Its appearance has always been epic, whether in the trailer for Dawn of War, where you get that spectacular sight of the assault cannon just raging and chewing up enemy en masse. Oh, and the ever classic close combat kill. Or the marvelous short clips that start with Waking Dread. I really like this growly, rolling coal style engine startup sound. And the follow up, Dreadfall, where the Dreadnought just massacres the Chaos Scum in fantastically brutal fashion. Again, with that withering barrage of assault cannon fire for starters, and then giving the foe lashings of piping hot Prometheum. And I also really like this bit, shielding the sarcophagus with its fist before just shredding the attacking aircraft. Even on paper, this bit, with exceedingly polite dreadnought slipping through the crowd to catch the closing city gates so the stranded civilians can get inside before the tyrannids arrive, and once again the dreadnought gives everything and perishes in the fight. But what chapter to go with as I start this new endeavour? Then I saw Angels of Death and the pious ritual to lower the sarcophagus onto the machine, the tolling bells, the invocations for the machine spirit to revive him. And then, when he enters the fray and just shreds everything so the technorine can try and get the ship free. Around this time, I also came across a post where someone's cat had died, and in memoriam, they had incurred a tuft of their fur in a dreadnought. Dude, you're killing me here. Oh, and of course, when Ignis finally falls, this bit was of course brutal. Rest, brother. Not enough left of me to save a second time. into the Blood Angels lore and this works even better because if you like your box melts then the Sons of Sanguinius not only have your standard variant but you also can field a Death Company Dreadnought and a Librarian one as well. Okay, sold! Shut up and take my money! First up I came across this fine fellow. I do love how people name things to dodge GW's aggressive IP defense police. The Blood Brothers Death Company Thick Boy of Redemption. I don't know if a Death Company Redemptor is a thing, but this model is just a beaut. Beaut, Clark is a beaut! I really have to make this one, but let's stick with the smaller fellows for now. Anywho, on to stuff that actually filled. I found this STL on 3D Cult and it's for free, and you can print normal Dreadnoughts Death Company versions and add some flair to get something perfect for a librarian. First up, download the files and drag and drop them batch by batch into Lychee. This batch is everything that needs to be duplicated, so select the lot and hit mirror to get the left and right variants for the build, and then export to the thumb drive. Off to the printer, one batch had a couple of fouls, which means trouble is afoot. I donned gloves and a respirator to protect from the resin and the fumes, I removed the models from the build plate and then slipped the plastic scraper gently into the vat to explore. And yep, there were some patches of solid resin stuck to the vat from a previous print. Less I. Gotta remember to check it every time. Okay, I've gone and thrown away the empty resin bottle, so I'll have to make do with this Merica Svedka bottle. Drop a funnel into the bottle, add a little sieve, and the handle props up perfectly on the printer lid to keep it stable as I slowly pour all the resin into the bottle, and there they are, those failed prints. With the plastic scraper, get as much resin out as possible, and then use the scraper to get the failures off the plastic bottom, and then clean up the vat with a microfiber cloth. Pour the resin back into the vat through the sieve just to make sure no lumps go back in, and we move on to the next batch. When the print works perfectly, scrape them off the build plate, drop them in the pickle strainers that are filled with alcohol, and bob them up and down to strip away the excess resin and clean off all that urukai esque goop. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Once done, tip them out onto a paper towel and let them dry for a few minutes. Then into a bowl of warm water to soften them up and then they just pop free of the supports with ease. And now on to assembly. I'm just going to construct the main body because there are so many weapon loadouts that I want to magnetize those. Or what about a magnet? What magnet? What about it? The main body slots together with ease and in fact fits so snugly that you could probably skip the glue entirely. Anywho, once assembled, onto the legs they go and then on go the shin guards. Two round stubs emerge from the hull to slot into the armholes, so with wire cutters I snipped these off and then went in with the tips to trim down any excess before shaving it flat with an exacto. The armholes are perfect for the middle sized magnet from my magnet sole pack, so I dropped the column of magnets onto the base of drill bits to form the right size and then drilled into the hull. I added a bit of super glue, inserted the column, propped it up so that the first one is kept in place and left it to dry. Once dry, just pop the column free. For the weapons, push the column towards the hull and if it repels, it's the right way round. So add a drop of super glue, insert and wipe aside with my thumbnail so a single magnet is left in the hole and my thumbnail keeps it in place as the other magnets move away and out of attraction range so that they don't flip over or move. The limbs all clip nicely to a metal ruler that balances across a box that some hiking boots came in, allowing me to use some Mephiston red primer to blast everything all at once from every angle. Now, this meant that the magnets got some primer on them, which I want to get off, and Exacto risks slicing up the model. Was there anything about slicing you up? But I discovered that my set of lock picks work brilliantly. They are designed for delicate work, and a standard rack has a nice curved blunt tip that is ideal for getting in there and scraping away excess paint or primer off the surface of the magnets. On to painting! A layer of Mephiston red base, and using a larger brush to cut down on painting time, a nice layer over the entirety of the legs and torso, and over all the weapon loadouts. Once this was done, onto some iron hands steel base for the shin plates, the shoulder mountings, and the vision slot in the sarcophagus, as well as the wing emblems and those cool exhaust ports on the back, and on the power fist flamer. On the weapons, the steel goes on barrels and ammunition boxes. Back to the librarian, I don't want shiny gold, rather something a little more subdued. So Retributor armor base, painted on the wings, the mounting plates for the arms, the smoke launchers, the sculpted death mask, the exhaust pipes, and where the false halberd meets the haft. Sticking with the librarian and its false halberd, a layer of Imric blue dry painted across all the surfaces of the blade. Right. I'm going with Karaberg Crimson to give the red some shade and definition. I pondered Nuln Oil, but I think it's just way too dark. They look more dirty than what I'm going for. Painted it all over the models and weapons, and it settled in the gaps and highlighted the raised areas. Around the emblems, to make them pop a little more, it gave them a hint of oiliness or grime, of having seen a lot of action from decades, if not centuries, of use. For the iron hand steel, however, null oil is still perfect to settle into the heat shields, the ammunition boxes and barrels to make the steel also look heavily used and slightly worn. Now, Astro Wrath Red. Get a little onto the dry brush, shed the excess on my thumb, and then a delicate dry brush onto the edges. The distinct corners of the torso, the armoured plates, the limbs, and the legs, getting just a slightly brighter edge against the now subdued Mephiston and Caraberg Crimson. Back to the Halberd, a dry brush of Ethereum Blue along the edges and on the circuitry, giving it a nice glow. Screaming Skull for the Oaths of Moment, the skulls on the shin plates and the other bone decorations, and the pages of the book on the librarian's shoulder. To accentuate the Screaming Skull, Seraphim Sepia Shade, applied all across it and it settles nicely into the edges and the pits, giving them some nice shadows. The light stroke lenses to the left of the sarcophagus, a little dab of moot green and some corn red to bring out the blood droplet emblems just to make them a little brighter and differentiate them from the Mephiston red. 
On to the plasma weapons. The areas that will be glowing get a layer of white scar and then when dry, on goes the tesseract glow. This nice watery technical paint just settles in the troughs, creating a deeper hue and leaving the raised ridges with just a hint of green. The Seraphim Sepia Shade not only worked to treat on the bone, but when applied over the gold, it also gives it a nice look. Almost brazen rather than gold. Hmm. Anyway, okay, here we are so far. Looking really good for my first go at Blood Angels. Maybe in the future when I get a bit better and more experienced, I'll play with transfers or painting some details like chapter markings and identities and such. But for my first go, I'm dead chuffed. But what about these bases? They're a little on the plain side. And although I might plan on using sand for the other Blood Angel sources to simulate the surface of Baal, these bad boys could do with some suitably impressive bases. I found these online, scaled them to the right size, printed them up, and in some spots, I actually left the supports in place as they look like areas of scaffolding. Off to the box, they get a blast of black primer and a layer of Abaddon black, then a brief dry brush of iron hand steel, and then the Abaddon and some army painter angelic yellow to create some hazard striping. So here we are, three dreadnoughts from the Ninth Legion, the Blood Angels, sons of the great angel Sanguinius. Each of these potent combat walkers carries the shattered remains of a gravely wounded space marine, interred within a life-sustaining armoured sarcophagus. Each critically injured warrior operates the mighty robot body through neural links and sensor implants and can call upon an arsenal of devastating weaponry as they continue their service to the chapter and the emperor. Assault cannon, heavy plasma cannon, multi-belter, twin las cannon, all supplement the inbuilt storm bolter and power fist. And a Furioso Dreadnought, sometimes equipped with a heavy frag cannon, but this individual is dedicated to close combat, with a pair of blood talons supplementing their heavy flamers. And a Librarian Dreadnought, the final resting place of an Astartes Librarian, who bends the warp to his will to serve the Imperium and defend his battle brothers. Interred within a Furioso pattern Dreadnought, with a built-in psychic hood, the Librarian wields a false halberd, a psychically attuned close combat weapon fueled by the Psyker's powers, along with a blood talon power fist to assail the foe, because even in death, the Dreadnought still serves.